death be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be, much pleasure. Then from thee much more must flow, and soonest our best men with thee do go, rest of their bones, and soul's delivery. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men, and dust with poison, war, and sickness dwell, and poppy or charms can make us sleep as well and better than thy stroke. Why swallowest thou then? One short sleep past we wake eternally, and death shalt be no more. Death, thou shalt die. Bully Sonnet 10 by John Donne challenges the fear of death. It reflects the author's belief that death is nothing to fear. Death, according to John Donne, is more like going to sleep and then waking up in eternity. The author is mocking death and basically telling it that it can't even act without fate, chance, kings, or desperate men, and it's nothing but a slave to them. This poem goes hand in hand with a verse in the Bible from 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians states, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. John Donne's message in the Holy Sonnet 10 is to not let death have any say in how you live your life. At the end of the sonnet, he says, Death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. Don wants people to live their lives to the fullest and never have death even cross their mind. The first quatrain focuses on the subject of this poem, death. By addressing death, Don makes it into a character using personification. Don warns death to take no pride in its mighty and dreadful force in lines 1 and 2. He concludes the beginning argument of the first quatrain by declaring to death that those it claims to kill die not. By this he means death can't completely kill anyone because their soul will live eternally. The second quatrain, which is closely linked with the first through the ABBA rhyme scheme, turns the criticism of death as less than fearful into praise for death's good qualities. From death comes much pleasure since those good souls whom death releases from the earthly suffering experience rest of their bones. Don then returns to criticizing death for thinking too highly of itself. Death is no sovereign, but a slave to fate, chance kings, and desperate men. This last demonstrates that there is no hierarchy in which death is near the top. Although a desperate man can choose death as an escape from earthly suffering, even the rest which death offers can be achieved by better poppy or charms. So even there, death has no superiority. The final couplet caps the argument against death. Not only is death the servant of other powers and essentially impotent to truly kill anyone, but also death is itself destined to die when, as in the Christian tradition, the dead are resurrected to their eternal reward. Here Don echoes the sentiment of the Air Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, where Paul writes that the final enemy to be destroyed is death. Don taps into his Christian background to point out that death has no power and one day will cease to exist. I run hospitals, not health spas. Two beds to a room, no exceptions. There was a survey once. A thousand people asked if they could know in advance would they want to know the exact day of their death. Who the hell is that? Who the hell are you? 96% of them said no. Oh, God. What am I, in the Borg? That was the first time I laid eyes on Edward Cole. I want my own room. You run hospitals, not health spas. Two beds to a room, no exceptions. Damned if I'm gonna spend the next three weeks laying next to zombie boy.
My freshman philosophy professor assigned this exercise and called it a bucket list. We were supposed to make a list of all the things we wanted to do in our lives before we kicked the bucket. Cutesy. It's pointless now. We could do this. We should do this. This is living! I hate your rotten guts! Is he insane? Depends. You gonna drive it or buy it a dress? Just getting to know each other. I don't understand how you can run off with a total stranger. I've got 45 years greased up under the hood of a car. I think I've earned some time for myself. You got kids? I don't see her. It's time. Why are we, uh... Oh, my God. What are you so afraid of? Just because I told you my story does not invite you to be a part of it. Dear Edward, there's no way I can repay you for all you've done for me. So rather than try, I'm just going to ask you to do something else for me. Find the joy in your life. You hate me. Not yet. <laughs> we live, we die, and the wheels on the bus go round and round. Out of you. Nobody cares what you think. The movie Bucket List and the Holy Sonnet 10 share the common theme of not fearing death. In the Bucket List, corporate billionaire Edward Cole and working class mechanic Carter Chambers have nothing in common except for their terminal illnesses. While sharing a hospital room together, they decide to leave it and to do all the things they have ever wanted to do before they die according to their bucket list. In the process, both of them heal each other, become unlikely friends, and ultimately find joy in life. In Holy Sonnet 10, John Don implied that we shouldn't fear death. In comparison to Beowulf, this theme is also emphasized. For example, Don says, Death be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. Don is saying that death is something really mighty and powerful, but later claims that death isn't to anything to be scared of. Death is also portrayed as something to not fear in the epic poem Beowulf. In Beowulf's last battle with the dragon, he states, I've never known fear. As a youth, I've fought in endless battles. I am old now, but I will fight again. Seek fame still. Beowulf is stating that he has never feared anything, most importantly, death. Preparing to fight the dragon, Beowulf goes into battle knowing that he could be easily killed, but reminds himself that death is something not to fear, and he has won endless battles before without having the fear of death. We're gonna let you go, okay? Okay. What are you gonna do now? I thought I'd move out to Las Vegas. My heart is crying, crying. I just need some cash tonight. Please, don't drink it in here. Ben wasn't looking for a fresh start. Five hundred. Five hundred dollars for a 93 Rolex Daytona. I'll do it. He wasn't looking for any trouble. I was wondering if you would buy me a drink. Do you mind if I buy her a drink? <laughs> and he wasn't trying to fall in love. I really wish you'd come home with me. You're so cute. And I'm really good and bad too, believe me. No? Okay. But now, on the road to nowhere, he's about to take a detour. Hi, are you working? Working? What do you mean working? I'm walking. It's pretty funny. If you'll come to my room for one hour, I will give you $500. I'm gonna love you. I'm Ben. I'm Sarah. So you know, brings you to Las Vegas. I came here to drink myself to come death. <laughs> A movie contrasting the Holy Sonnet 10 is Leaving Las Vegas. In this movie, screenwriter Ben Anderson started drinking heavily. 
He became more and more isolated and started to trouble women in bars because he wanted to have sex with them. His employer soon found out, which then led to his firing. After he got fired, he decided to leave everything behind and move to Las Vegas so he could drink himself to death. Ben Anderson has no appreciation for life and wants death to take on to its mighty and dreadful label that John Don does not believe in. Does it ever feel like everyone's got more going than you do? Oops. That everyone is smart. So you're Al Myers, kid? Yes, I am. You look pretty stupid to me. Thank you. You say the best skier in town just ran off with your girlfriend? Even your younger brother does better than you do? <laughs> and that nobody even cares? That broke up with me. Oh, that's nice. Well, you might be right. But remember one thing. I haven't even been to New York City. Nobody was ever better off dead. The truth is, I could out-ski you any day of the week. Oh, really? Yeah, you want to race, I'll take you on any day, sucker. Go that way, really fast. If something gets in your way, turn. All you need is guts. All right! I'm gonna race, I'm gonna lose, and I'm gonna die in that order. Go! And you'll never doubt yourself again. He's skiing on one ski! Better off dead. And that's a real shame when folks be throwing away a perfectly good white boy like that. Lane Myers, a geeky loser high school student, loses his girlfriend when she dumps him in their senior year for the new captain of the ski team. Crushed by his loss, Lane decides that suicide is the only answer. His various pathetic attempts only end in embarrassing failure, making matters worse. On top of all this, his father is harassing him about his life and his broken down car. He is being stalked by a lunatic paper boy, and his 10 year old brilliant gifted brother is quickly becoming Hugh Hefner. Lane Myers is expecting death to be mighty so he can be put out of his misery. He is nothing like John Don because he has no appreciation for life and wants nothing to do with it, where John Don feels that there is no such thing as death and he will live eternally. John Don was born in London in 1572. He was raised Roman Catholic. Catholicism was hated in London during this time. In fact, it was illegal. Growing up, his father died suddenly, forcing him to be raised by his mother. Later on in life, his brother died from a fever. These two deaths could be very well be where his theme of death came from. His Holy Sonnet 10 was published two years after he died. No one really knows when they were written, but many people think that they were written after his wife died. The sonnets talked about religion, death, violence, and sex. Holy Sonnet 10 is about death.